Thank you, Steve, and uh, good morning. Um, as uh, Steve said in his introduction, um, I'm going to begin uh, our, our, our sort of effort to narrow down a little bit uh, the First World War, looking at specific aspects of that experience. Um, what I'm going to focus on is one way in which the First World War was a global war, looking specifically at the experience of African Americans, uh, but in the larger context of the overall experience in World War I of peoples of color. Um, as I'll talk about in greater detail, one thing that scholars have done lately, and by lately I mean say in the last 20 years, um, is rediscover the ways in which the First World War, while it was predominantly an experience of Europeans, white Europeans, if you will, um, it was a multiracial war um, for reasons that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, and there's been a lot of work done, particularly since the mid-1990s, but especially in the last, um, I'd say, 10 years of the, of the 21st century about people of color and um, what they went through in the First World War, how they contributed to the war efforts of various countries. Um, one thing you may have been able to glean from the introduction um, is that I, my research specialty is actually written in the British Empire, um, which w is a reason why I want to apologize first off. Um, I don't have many, I'll have some images that I'll show you, but I don't have many images of African Americans in World War I. Uh, my collection is from the Imperial War Museum in London, and shockingly, the Imperial War Museum has not made a great effort to collect images of African Americans uh, in the war. So, uh, but, but I will uh, discuss them in detail. Okay. Okay. So, looking at why uh, the First World War was a multiracial war, the very simple explanation for that is that in 1914, the major European powers involved in the war had, uh, in, in many cases, vast colonial empires. Uh, Germany had one, they were a newcomer to empire, but, but Germany had an empire in Africa. Um, and the British and French had the largest colonial empires in the world, in Africa and Asia. Um, and Dr. Seafried's images, uh, in a very vivid way, demonstrate just how vast that empire was, uh, especially in Africa. Um, the, the huge, almost the entire continent held by one European power or another. And also, uh, with the British, and again, if we're talking about peace of peoples of color, I'm defining that as, as Africans and Indians primarily, but the British controlled uh, the subcontinent of India, and as, as uh, Dr. C. Fee was saying, that's hundreds of millions of people, um, uh, subjects of the British Empire. So, these vast colonial empires, in which, which are populated mostly by non-white uh, subjects, when the great powers of Europe go to war, that means their empires go to war as well. And, and that's the situation in this period. In most cases, most of these imperial possessions didn't have a lot of say about whether they were going to be involved in the war at all. They were going to be because, uh, you know, the, the, the country that controlled that, that colony was in the war. Um, on the one hand, the imperial holdings themselves often became battlegrounds. Uh, Dr. Seafried's presentation pointed out the fighting that went on in, in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly. There is a situation where the British and French were primarily trying to take Germany's colonies in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there was also fighting in the Middle East that involved uh, particularly the British going after the Ottoman Empire's territory. There you will have a large uh, number of Indian troops uh, who were involved, and I'll talk about that. Uh, in greater detail. Another way in which um, for the European, um, for the empires of Europe, uh, it, it, how that became a multiracial war was that the British and the French in particular wanted to draw upon the resources, uh, you can use the word exploit to describe it, exploit the resources of their empires for their own war efforts. Uh, they were more able to do this than say Germany. There may have been a point where in 1914 Germany for various reasons didn't very quickly mobilize the resources of its empire toward its war effort. Um, and after 1914, really, they didn't have a chance to do that because their imperial possessions were already either taken by the, the allied forces or battlegrounds. So they couldn't really draw from those resources in the same way. But the British and French maintained that access to the resources of their empires throughout the war. And they were extremely important uh, 
and the war efforts of those, those countries. And we're talking about human and material resources drawn from those empires. What I'm going to focus on are the human resources. Um, and in a lot of these cases, these were uh, peoples of color who were enlisted um, in one way or another toward the war effort, either as soldiers or uh, more commonly as laborers uh, in the service of Britain, France, and so on. Um, another way in which uh, World War I was a multiracial war, and the one that, that probably people in this audience are more familiar with, most of you, um, is when the United States enters, enters World War I in 1917, it is a multiracial democracy uh, entering World War I, with a, a, a large, and in this period you can say largely oppressed, uh, African American minority uh, within the country. African Americans would necessarily be incorporated within the nation's war effort and actually be crucial to that war effort. But there is at this time, and we'll talk about the, uh, you know, the state of race relations in the United States in this period, but there's a massive divergence in white and black expectations about the nature and meaning of African Americans' contribution to the war effort. Um, and I'll, again, speak more specifically about that. What that massive divergence in expectations illustrates is uh, the profound racial divide um, of the era. Okay, so focusing first on uh, European empires, people of color within the European empires and their role in, in World War I, just some uh, helpful statistics, hopefully helpful statistics on the numbers of um, peoples of color recruited uh, by Britain and France. Uh, Britain recruited 1.4 million Indians uh, to serve in World War I, uh, almost all volunteers, by the way. Um, and, and part of this is a, is a phenomenon of uh, something known as the Indian Army, which is actually Great Britain's largest land force at the time of World War I, but it's primarily composed of Indians, Indian rank and file serving under, in most cases, uh, European officers. Um, and they were enlisted uh, to, to fight in various roles uh, throughout the war. Um, also, several, Britain recruited several hundred thousand black Africans, um, and this statistic doesn't include native porters uh, recruited in Africa who were essential to uh, European war effort in, in Africa. I don't know how many people know this, but in sub-Saharan Africa you can't really use, use horses for transportation um, or uh, to, to uh, carry supplies and that kind of thing because of the tsetse fly. Uh, and sleeping sickness, which, which tends to kill off horses in sub-Saharan Africa. So who was transporting the goods uh, of all the combatants in Africa? It was human porters. And so, you know, hundreds of thousands of them were recruited to the various um, to the war efforts of, of various European powers. But outside of that, there were also several thousand black Africans, uh, several hundred thousand black Africans uh, recruited by the British, and then also more than 16,000 West Indians. Uh, black African recruitment varied. Um, sometimes it was uh, forcible drafting, uh, especially when you're talking about the native porters. Uh, but but it, it also could include volunteers. France enlisted around 200,000 North Africans, Moroccans, Algerians, and Tunisians, and 166,000 West Africans, who were often sort of generically called Senegalese, but many who were serving in uh, the Senegalese units in the French army were from various parts of uh, French-controlled West Africa. And also, we're only learning um, about uh, this group of uh, uh, participants in the war very recently, 46,000 Madagascans. Um, and I'm not including in this figure again, uh, I'm leaving out lots of other uh, um, peoples within the, the French Empire who, who uh, were recruited to the war effort leaving out, for instance, uh, Indo-Chinese labor, Chinese labor, um, and so on. All of those were, were large numbers uh, were enlisted as well. For the United States, uh, nearly 400,000 African Americans were inducted into U.S. forces, 200,000 of whom served in Europe. I'm going to talk more specifically about the circumstances in which they served and the roles that they played in the service. One thing to keep in mind uh, with all of this, though, is you're talking about the sort of the high watermark of imperialism 
uh, European imperialism around the world. And you're talking about as well in terms of the one of the fundamental ideologies undergirding that European imperialism, you're talking about the kind of high water mark of white supremacy. And so that the, the roles and the circumstances of all the peoples of color serving in World War I, fighting for these European empires, fighting for the United States, were shaped by that context of imperialism and white supremacy. Um, that explains a lot of what we'll see later. Okay, just some images um, to show you some of the um, specific kinds of troops involved in World War I. Germany, um, again, not having great access or not having uncontested access to its imperial resources for most of the war, but also uh, being ideologically more committed to not employing what they called native troops to fight against Europeans, only used African troops in their African colonies. But the bulk of German forces fighting in Africa were made up of African rank and file with European officers. Uh, the German um, native troops were called Ascaris, um, and these are some of the Ascaris, again, with a European officer um, there in the lead. But I think, Dr. Seafried, you mentioned uh, General Leto Forbeck, uh, who the British chased around East Africa for much of the war. The, pre predominantly, his troops were Ascaris uh, like these. And the British who were chasing them around predominantly were Indian troops uh, for much of the war. Um, Britain made extensive use of Indian troops in, in various roles um, in a lot of, in most of uh, World War I's theaters. Um, combat troops in the Middle East and Europe and labor uh, in all of the theaters that Britain was involved in in World War I. Uh, this, this picture is of Indian troops from Baluchistan, um, and they were part of the Indian Army that was sent to uh, fight in Belgium and France in 1914. Um, these were the only non-white troops that the British employed in combat in Europe. The British were much more leery than the French, as we'll see, um, about employing non-white troops to fight against white troops. Um, especially in Europe. Um, so certain units of the Indian Army were the only ones who were allowed to, to do that. <laughs> Most of the Indian Army that was sent to Europe in 1914 was withdrawn uh, by 1916, sent to other theaters. Um, the British were worried about certain aspects of their performance there and also uh, the effect of morale on the kind of fighting that they experienced on the Western Front, the trench warfare, um, and, and the effect of the climate in Europe on the morale of Indian troops. Uh, but some Indian units fought for the duration of the war on the Western Front. Uh, the famous Bengal Lancers, uh, for instance, stayed on the Western Front uh, during World War I. Um, these are Zulu from South Africa who've been recruited to a labor battalion um, for the British. Um, the British, like a lot of Europeans, had very uh, developed ideas about so-called martial races versus those who were not martial races. Um, and so uh, tribes, um, peoples that the British believed had a sort of warlike uh, mentality and a warlike tradition, they, they, they described as martial races. Now you would think the Zulu would fall in that category of martial races given their history and traditions. However, you could be sort of rejected as a martial race if you had a, a, a a continuing resistance to British rule, which the Zulu did. <laughs> um, so they, they were only recruited for uh, labor service, and these are some of the Zulu who were being sent off to war with a traditional sort of Zulu ceremony uh, for sending you know, uh, men off to war, but they're going to serve in, in uh, labor battalions exclusively. Now, alone among the major combatants, um, the French uh, used troops on a, used African troops on a large scale uh, in Europe uh, in combat, um, and underlying this this use of African troops in combat on this large scale was something called the idea of uh, la force noire, um, and this was translates to the black force. Um, the idea behind this is the brainchild, uh, largely of a general named Charles uh, Mangin, and. The people who promoted this believed that France could make up for its democratic, democratic, 
demographic disadvantages against Germany by enlisting combat troops uh, from the empire. So these, for instance, are Senegalese troops. Um, large numbers of Senegalese, uh, something like 166,000, uh, were actually drafted in the French service, and most of them uh, played combat roles on the Western Front. In fact, Senegalese troops and, and some of the troops in North Africa uh, were considered shock troops. They were considered elite troops and were often at the forefront of attacks uh, and battles uh, for France. Again, you know, part of this whole martial tradition idea. Now, not to say that this was um, welcome universally in France. In a lot of cases, uh, African troops were welcomed. You know, people bought into the idea of La Force Noire and welcomed them as, as, as saviors of France and they experienced um, a lot of celebration in certain cases throughout France, but that, you know, there were a lot of people in France also who were worried about what Europeans tended to worry about in this period, and that is arming large numbers of people of color who might one day turn those skills and arms on, uh, you know, uh, their rulers in the empire or uh, the ruling classes at home. So, um, and also the, the French allies, the British, were not really crazy about this idea either, and the Germans were absolutely incensed about the idea of the French using large numbers of uh, non-white colonial troops in combat roles. Uh, there was a lot of hysterical German propaganda produced uh, in these years, um, you know, depicting uh, these troops as savages and, and barbaric and so on. Okay. For African Americans, um, it's a little bit of a, a, a there are some parallels between what's happening uh, with non-white serving in, in European forces and there are some differences. Um, one parallel is the predominantly labor role um, uh, for African American troops. Um, the American army was had some of the same trepidations that, that uh, other forces, European forces had about arming large numbers of uh, uh, black troops um, and having them serve in combat roles. So even if they were before the war a, a combat division, let's say, and there were African American combat uh, regiments, battalions, divisions, so on that, that predated the war, generally they were reduced or, or relegated to labor roles uh, during the war itself. So you have 80% of African Americans who um, perform labor functions uh, in the First World War. There was one uh, African American combat division, the 93rd, uh, which in included the 369th uh, Infantry Regiment, uh, the famous Harlem Hellfighters, that was actually attached to the French Army um, once, once the United States was involved in the war, and they served there with distinction, um, earning, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, several Croix de Guerre, um, and also serving in the line longer than any other American unit uh, in World War I. Um, there was one other African American combat division, the only one to serve in combat in the American Expeditionary Force, uh, and that was the 92nd Division. Their service was more controversial than the 93rd. Um, you know, there were a lot of people who were not interested in uh, African Americans serving with distinction in the American military, and so uh, largely unfairly they developed kind of a bad reputation uh, in the course of the war, um, and were, you know, uh, their record was kind of uh, tarnished uh, coming out of the war. And of course that was contested in the African American press. Um, and historians looking back on it have seen that, relatively speaking, the 92nd did as well or better than most American units um, serving in World War I. Um, African Americans uh, faced what they came to call the double war. Um, and that is fighting not, not only against the German enemy once they were overseas, but also overseas and at home fighting against Jim Crow. In fact, there were a lot of uh, African-American soldiers and leaders in the African-American community who regarded Jim Crow as the primary enemy, not the Germans. Um, and in, in serving, serving in the army, African-Americans tended to face an enormous amount of racial violence, uh, discrimination, um, and exploitation, and they found the army to be uh, less a refuge from white supremacy uh, than actually an institution that reflected the white supremacy that was prevalent in uh, the United States at the time. Um, 
And you know, you can. I don't have time to sort of go into the, to the details of the, the incidents and, and things like that that happened and, and sort of the um, specific examples of the kind of racial violence and discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, that occurred during the war, but it's legion. Like you just, you read about these, uh, the, the um, various kind of skirmishes between African-American soldiers and white soldiers serving in proximity to each other in the United States and in France, and it gets kind of mind numbing. Um, and that's unfortunate. Some of the most famous um, sort of darker episodes that occurred during the war were, for instance, um, the revolt of the 25th Infantry in Houston, uh, who had, while they were serving uh, in Houston, had faced a lot of provocation from members of the white community, especially white law enforcement, and uh, sort of marched, uh, very disciplined, into a part of Houston that was close to the, to the Army base and basically started shooting up the town. Um, and you know this is this is in, in a lot of ways this is what whites were most afraid of with armed African Americans in their midst was their ability to resist uh, and counter this kind of um, this kind of provocation in the way that the 25th did. Um, Army justice was swift on the 25th. Um, several uh, over a hundred were court-martialed. Members of the unit were court-martialed, and I think about. I can't remember the exact number, it was somewhere between 13 and 17 were hanged uh, very quickly after this, this incident. Um, coming out of the First World War, one of the major debates with scholars now is to what extent was the First World War a watershed for African Americans politically and socially? Um, did anything change? Definitely African American leaders uh, and soldiers who went into service in the American military expect, you know, they saw the war as an opportunity to promote change. Uh, in the same way that the Civil War, for instance, had been, uh, war service in the Civil War had been uh, a way for African Americans to make credible claims to citizenship, to equality, uh, the basic humanity. A lot were hoping that the First World War might provide those same opportunities. Um, I would say that uh, based on based on what I know about this, that didn't necessarily that you know concrete political changes for African Americans didn't really emerge out of the First World War. If anything, there was kind of a backlash um, against uh, the idea that African Americans might have attained any kind of um, uh, greater self-esteem and would make broader claims to to citizenship and equality as a result of their war service. There's a real backlash to that if you look at. Uh, race riots and lynchings and stuff uh, in the late war period into 1919, they actually increase uh, dramatically in this period. So I wouldn't say that was the, the impact of the First World War uh, for African Americans. It's not a watershed in that way. But there are some ways in which it is significant. Uh, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, for African Americans, uh, there's a phenomenon that's happening around the time of the First World War called the Great Migration. Um, it accelerates as a result of the war, as a result of uh, a lot of African Americans uh, going to work in factories in the North, um, job opportunities that open up, largely as a result of immigrants, um, fewer immigrants from overseas coming into the United States, and also many immigrants going into uniform fighting for the United States. There are job opportunities that open up in industry for African Americans, so more and more continue to move to the North. And the Great Migration is a phenomenon that you see from the late 19th century into the 1950s, um, which demographically dramatically changes the South uh, as the black population moves North and West. Um, that's accelerated by the war. For peoples of color generally, not just for African Americans, the war is an eye-opening experience. It's an eye-opening experience uh, in the sense that they go overseas and they see other possibilities um, for organizing society than what they're used to in the United States. The experience of, of going to France is particularly important uh, in this respect. Um, you know, you can, you can sort of overblow um, how uh, the, the lack of discrimination or the, the, the lack of um, the kind of segregation that, that black Americans were used to when they get to France, you can overblow how it's not there. It, it is there to some extent, and it's very much policed by the American army in particular. But um, generally, African Americans and all troops of color are treated uh, more fairly, more humanely, more equally in France than they've been used to in the United States. 
So there's a whole other possibility, a whole other way of interacting with, with uh, white populations uh, in particular. Um, also, and just, you know, you can talk about the details of this, maybe if we have a question and answer or something like that. But if the war on the one hand showed the strength and resilience of Western imp imperialism and white supremacy, and I believe it did because uh, Western empires, British and French, increased as, as a result of World War I, no imperial territories uh, were lost by the winners in, in World War I. There weren't, you know, uh, massive revolutions that overthrew um, uh, colonial rule in most places. Um, white supremacy also showed its strength and resilience and its resistance to any claims uh, made by peoples of color. It also revealed potential weaknesses in those edifices and raised the possibility of revolutionary change, if for nothing else in the First World War was such a revolutionary experience, generally. Uh, and, so, and caused such revolutionary transformation, people began to think anything is possible. Uh, anything can happen. You know, maybe one day we can overthrow this, this system that seems so strong and resilient um, right now. And the last thing, I know I'm getting close to time, the last thing I wanted to mention um, was the casualty figures. Um, you see there about um, 100, 100,000 Indian troops perishing in World War I, 150,000 and 200,000 African soldiers, and again, not including civilian populations in Africa uh, or the figures for native quarters, sometimes had casualty rates of 20%, um, 30, and 30,000 from West Africa alone. African American combat deaths are very low, um, which is not surprising uh, given how few uh, were allowed to participate in combat, 773, and virtually all of those are from the 93rd and 92nd divisions. Um, and there is a sense coming, you know, for all peoples of color coming out of World War I, of their sacrifice in that war, and what is going to be, you know, how are we going to um, validate that sacrifice? Uh, that's something common to all the peoples who participate in World War I, uh, but, and peoples of color are part of that um, as well. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs>